was an ancient human species that inhabited eastern and southern Africa. And the fossils of this species are really important because they're some of the oldest fossils of our genus, the genus Homo. Now recently I got a partial skeleton of a Homo habilis and today I'm going to show you this skeleton, what parts of the body it preserves, and what it can tell us about this interesting and mysterious species. This is one of the best preserved Homo habilis skeletons that scientists have ever found. And that's kind of disappointing because this is a very poorly preserved fragmentary find. Not a single one of the bones you see here is complete. Each of them is missing pieces or is a fragment of a larger bone. And if that wasn't bad enough, they're all heavily abraded. Their surfaces have been eroded. And in many places, they're missing the outer layer of bone, making it difficult to take accurate measurements. And unfortunately, that's the case for the two main Homo habilis skeletons. OH62 and this one KNMER3735. Now that's not to say we don't have any good fossil material from Homo habilis. We have several nicely preserved skulls, this being the best of them. So we know a little bit about their skull, their teeth, and their jaw. What is more of a mystery is their postcranial skeleton or the entire rest of their body. We have very few postcranial remains. We don't know a lot about any part of their body besides their head. This skeleton is known as KNMER3735. Let me break that down for you. That KNM stands for Kenya National Museum. This skeleton was found in Kenya, so it's stored in their national museum. That ER stands for East Rudolph the locality where the specimen was found. Specifically, it was found at the site called Kubi Fora. And then at the end, that number 3735 is the collection number. So it was the 3735th find. These bones were found in 1975. And when they were first discovered, they weren't found encased in rock. They had already eroded out of the sandstone that they had been fossilized in. And they were just lying, apparently scattered on the ground. And that raises an interesting question. How do we know that all of these little bone fragments belong together? One of the most obvious things you would look at to determine if the bones of multiple individuals were mixed together in the skeleton is duplication of parts. So say you found two right elbows. Well, you know you either have a three-armed animal or more likely you have two different individuals in your sample. Now, none of these bones are duplicated. And in fact, no other hominins were found at this particular site in Kubifora where this skeleton was found. That's kind of less convincing in this case because of how fragmentary the skeleton is. They're, the more fragmentary, the fewer bones you have, the less you would expect to see duplicated parts anyway. But there's really no reason to think that these bones come from multiple individuals either. They all seem to be roughly around the same size and it seems that they would have been able to fit together in the body of a single organism. Okay, so now let's look at what parts of the body we actually have here, beginning with the skull. So here I have the bones of the cranium and most of these are just indistinguishable little fragments from the cranial vault. However, there are a few that you can see some more details on. For example, this one. There's a little hole here, and that is the hole for your ear. So we know that this is the temporal bone. You can see here it is on the modern human. So this is the corresponding part right here. And you can see here a little ridge that forms the base of this mastoid process right here. So we've got that. We've also got right here a little fragment of the zygomatic bone. So this is your cheekbone right here, and it kind of fits right there on the modern human. And we also have this piece, which is a piece of the frontal bone, which is kind of right above your eyes. And this would fit right like that. So you can see we have a few distinguishable parts of the skull, but not a lot actually. This is a piece of a scapula or shoulder blade. 
Here's the bone in a modern human, and you can see right here you've got this kind of roundish convex area. That is where your shoulder joint is. Your arm bone fits together right into here. On the back, you have this long ridge. It's called the scapular spine, and this is a piece of that spine. Next, let's move down to your arm bones. This is a piece of your right elbow. It's from your humerus, so your upper arm bone. And this is one of the nicest preserved pieces of this whole skeleton, actually. You can kind of see this is your whole arm bone there. That's what it looks like. And this is just that bottom section there. Over here, I have a piece from the other side of your elbow joint. This is your radius, one of your lower arm bones. This is a modern human radius here. And you can see we have mainly just the upper portion of the radius. We do have one little baby fragment from further down the shaft as well though. And now we move on to bones of the hand. These are two little finger bones. We don't know exactly which fingers they're from. It's usually kind of hard to tell that. This is probably a good time to mention that there are some additional bones that are missing here. There are some additional fragments of the hand and there are some additional little pieces of the skull. And these are missing because they're so tiny that the casting department doesn't actually make casts of them. It, they're just kind of useless itty bitty fragments that don't hold any information. But there are a few little extra tiny pieces of the hand and a few little extra little pieces of the skull that aren't included here. Here in the middle is the sacrum. So this is the bone that connects your two hip bones in the back. It's right above your tailbone. And this guy is so badly preserved. It's, it's amazing to me. It is just covered in little pits, very badly eroded. This is a modern human sacrum, you can see here, and it's formed of five different pieces. We can see here we've got parts of, especially the upper two and maybe a little bit of the third piece, but a lot of it is missing. And then we move on to leg bones. This is a piece of the femur, or your thigh bone here. The femur is the largest bone in your body, and this comes from down here, a little past the middle of the shaft. Right beneath it, this fragment is from the shaft of the tibia, or your shin bone. And then finally, over here in the corner, we've just got some little broken pieces of some long bones. I think there's a piece of a fibula, so another lower leg bone. Uh, some of them I don't know if we actually have identifications for. These are just very small broken pieces of long bones. At this point, I hope I've given you a little bit of appreciation for just how pathetic and poorly preserved this skeleton is. Yeah, it's a cool find, but also there's not a lot to go on here. You might be wondering, how do we even know that this comes from a homo habilis? Often in anthropology, teeth are used to diagnose species. We don't even have any teeth and the fragments of the skull are minuscule. Well, most of the species classification is based off of the recognizable skull fragments here, uh, specifically from the frontal, the way in which this bone dips down between the brow ridge and the brain case, uh, some features of this zygomatic and the temporal that distinguish it from other hominins. And then this Humerus here shows some affinities to other Homo habilis specimens like OH62, that other partial skeleton. So what can this skeleton really tell us about Homo habilis? Well, there's a few things. One of them comes from this little piece of the scapula. This is very um, robust. The places for muscle markings appear to be well developed. And so this seems to be evidence that this creature had a very powerful, well-muscled uh, forearm slash shoulder, which could indicate that it was climbing. However, there are other features that seem to kind of contradict this. For example, when we look at the head of the radius, the head of the radius seems to have been relatively small and not very large like it is in chimpanzees. When we look at the humerus, this distal arm bone here, and compare it to the size of the femur and the tibia, what we see is that it is this ratio between the sizes of these two bones is actually very similar to what it is in modern humans. So while Homo habilis had a human-like humero-femoral ratio, the ratio between the length or size of the humerus and the femur, it had a very ape-like brachial ratio. And the brachial ratio basically compares 
the size of your upper arm bone to that of your lower arm bone. So like apes, Homo habilis had a long forearm. When you look at the finger bones, you also see some ape-like features. In humans, the base of the finger is very wide compared to the middle of the finger bone. It, it narrows out a lot towards the middle of the individual phalange. Here though, the middle of the phalange is quite wide compared to the base. And that's something that you see in Lucy and other australopithecines and also in living apes. Interestingly, Homo habilis appears to have had ape-like limb proportions. When we look at humans, we see we have very long legs and we have shorter arms. Chimpanzees have very long arms and short legs. Australopithecines like Lucy were kind of in the middle. Their legs were longer than their arms, but not by a ton. Homo habilis appears to have been somewhat similar to Australopithecines in this respect, but its arms were maybe even a little longer relative to their legs. And you can see that this is kind of tentative. This is based on having to reconstruct what the lengths of bones are, and this is a kind of inexact science because of how fragmentary these bones are. But right now, that appears to have been the case. So unfortunately, Homo habilis remains shrouded in mystery. We still don't know a lot about this species, and only the discovery of further and more complete and better preserved skeletons can actually give us more insight into Homo habilis. Did it really have the limb proportions that we estimate based on these fragmentary skeletons? How did it walk? Was it active in the trees? These are all interesting and important questions that further fossils will hopefully help to clarify. I hope you enjoyed this brief look at this Homo habilis skeleton. If you're interested in kind of more of a history of the species Homo habilis, you can go and check out a video that I have linked down in the description below. Thanks for watching.